and that we have a solid rock in Jesus. Um, just, yeah, just thinking about, especially considering, you know, what's happened in the last few weeks and um, needing, you know, just needing a solid sense of, of footing. Um, yeah, so these songs, you know, and I think as we've been going through the series too, I've also been thinking about, you know, how to connect um, the themes to the songs and um, this, the theme of shalom, you know, that's so needed in our in our city, in our communities, in our, and even in our fellowship here. So, so let me pray as we, um, as we uh, open this time. Lord, we uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to gather here um, and the wonderful opportunity to be able to connect, to connect to you and connect to one another. And so I just pray for your spirit, Lord, to help us uh, this morning, um, to remind us that intimacy that um, that we can share with you and share with one another through the body of Christ and that you are our solid foundation you are our solid rock that we can stand on amen is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand. Other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His oath is covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. My soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, boldest to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. As Wes was preaching last week, I just remember uh, one of the things he was saying about, you know, if we just start with sin, it's a kind of like a different way of approaching. Um, we, we kind of forget the Genesis 1 and 2 part of God's vision of shalom for, for all of creation, including humanity. And just that intimacy that we saw in the garden, like that that's, that's the original vision. Yes, marred by sin, but... Um, we don't start at Genesis 3. Um, and so this song just reminded me of um, that, 
kind of original vision of God's desire to, to dwell with us, to be with us. Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew our names. Formed in his reflection, we are his glory on display. And his heart is good. He is always kind With a cross He proved He is on my side We are the sons We are the daughters of God No matter where we go We're close to the Father's heart And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's, and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. His love. His love He lavished on us And called us children of the King And in His loving kindness He chose the lowly and the weak And His heart is good And His heart is good He is always kind with the cross he proved, he is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's, and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. lies when the lies speak louder than the truth remind me I belong to you when I can't see past the dark of night remind me you're always by my side when the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. And when I can't see past the dark of night, remind me you're always by my side. You're by my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Yes, Lord. Just 
remind us again, Lord, of who we are truly in you. And then the cross, you sided with us and you restored to us that vision of what we saw in Genesis, the shalom that we have in you. shepherd I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkness, darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me So all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good 
every breath that I am made for, I will sing of the goodness of God. We will sing, and we will sing of the goodness of God. We will sing, we will sing of the goodness of God. Just take a moment to just remember the goodness of God and if you want to shout it out you can do that as well but um, just think of the goodness of God that we've experienced in our lives and as we have experienced as a community too just take a minute to do that I just wanted to offer one quick reflection off of that in prayer, and then we'll um, move into our service. But I was just listening this week um, to a seminar of a missionary a family that works in a Muslim nomadic community. And um, I don't think this is true of all people that practice um, the Muslim faith, but this was true in this situation. And she was describing their total fear of the enemy and the demonic to the point where they had these kind of healers, spiritual healers where they would go to and they would make these deals. They were so afraid of the demonic and there would be demon possession that would happen all the time. She said everybody she knew was afraid and experienced regular demonic oppression. And what they would do is they would say, they would make deals with these healers and say, okay, for three minutes, three months of relief from this demonic oppression, we'll give you this. And we'll do this and we'll do these sacrifices and we'll worship you in this way. So every time they had to make these deals with these de demons through these kind of healer people to be able to get relief for a short amount of time, you know, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, to live under that all the time. And here we are singing about how we're the sons and daughters of God. I'm just like so struck, like, wow, what we have access to in God and who Jesus is and his love for us, that sense that we belong to him no matter where we go. Even when we stumble, he is there in the midst of us. The promises we have, the goodness of God. Or we can even think about the Babylonian creation myths that we've been talking about in the midst of Genesis and that picture of the gods warring and making people his slaves. We are not God's slaves. Jesus says that we are his beloved sons and daughters. And so I just... Sometimes we can get used to the promises of God. We can get used to what we have access to in Jesus. But I just had in a fresh way this morning, like, wow, Jesus, that you love us, that you're always with us, that you don't treat us as slaves, that we don't have to make deals with you to get safety and be afraid of you all our lives. But you are a good, good father that loves us. So let me just pray for us this morning off of that. God, as we um, have been in Genesis and we see your character, we just say um, we're so grateful for who you are, that you are a God of kindness. You are a God of restoration. God, we belong to you, God. And so we thank you this morning. We remember what we have access to in you. Um, we remember your goodness and how you've been good to us. And we are grateful this morning. We're thankful, God. Would you help us not take that for granted, but to see that afresh today, Lord. So thank you so much. And we just invite you to just unwrap, um, wrap us in your goodness and your love this morning and speak to us 
um, as we continue on today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and bless the kids to be with Auntie Tammy in the back. She's going to take you guys to Kids Church, and then I'm going to invite Abner to introduce our guest. Good morning, River of Life. Good morning. All right. Um, our guest for this morning is uh, uh, Professor uh, Andy Bainero, uh who I took a class, a missiology class with Andy about five or six years ago. Going on six years, Andy. And his class actually came at the end of my, my experience in Fuller. Uh, I, I left the languages to the very, very end. So the, the torture at the very, very end. But, but before that, um, the last class that I took before, you know, I jumped into the language languages was Andy's class. And one of the things that I just really loved about Andy's uh, call to mission, to engage in mission, is that he always anchored it in God's vision of shalom for creation. And he always encourages us to think about uh, how history ends and how it is that, uh, uh, you know, when you look at scripture, it begins and ends in shalom and everything else in between is the restoration of, of God's purposes. And I felt led um, in my final paper at, at Fuller to actually write him a letter embedded into my final paper. So like uh, as part of my introduction, it was a, a letter to Andy and I'll share a little bit of what I told him. Uh, I said, I don't know what the protocol is for students giving the professors encouragement and praise, <laughs> but I want you to know that anchoring the topic of mission on God's covenant love for his people and on the eschatological promise of shalom is absolutely brilliant. I'm guessing that you and I won't cross paths too often in this lifetime, but I look forward to walking, taking walks with you someday and getting to know you better in the city of God. Uh, take my paper, this, my, my final paper, as one brother telling another brother what he has learned about God and where he believes the Lord is leading him. I look forward to comparing stories with you during our walks in the eternal city. Until then, shalom. And I seriously thought, you know, uh, when I went to Fuller, I was like, I'm, I'm done with like this stuff. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to engage in these issues. But um, the irony of it is, I think over the last five or six years, Andy is the person that I've had the most contact with at Fuller. And I think part of that is because of his uh, theology, his love uh, for the city, his love for his family, his community, and his willingness to constantly call me and say, hey, this is what I've been thinking. What, what are you thinking? Uh, he was actually one of the first people who uh, who told me that we should plant a church. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, we were hanging out at a coffee shop. So at many levels, uh, Andy has been a mentor and a friend. He is somebody that I, I deeply love and that I really just uh, thank you, brother, for, for joining us uh, this morning. So why don't you come up? I feel nervous. I'm like, I'm introducing, <laughs> <laughs> I'm introducing Andy, and uh, I felt nervous. I, I don't normally feel nervous up here, but why don't, you, why don't you come up and let me pray for you. You got your microphone on? It's yeah. Not okay. <laughs> Jesus, I thank you for Andy and Michelle and their family. Lord, I thank you for the work that you've been doing in him, Lord. Uh, Lord, not everybody talks about the theology of shalom. Not everybody anchors our, our purposes as a church in the concept of shalom. And, and I thank you that Andy is somebody who's just kind of gone all in, Lord. God, would you speak to us through him today? Amen. Thank you, brother. I love you, brother. I love you, too. And I, was... I didn't have to wait till eternity to <laughs> hang out with you again. <laughs> um, well, good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you here. I have to use a computer because that's just what I do all the time, and <laughs> I'm used to speaking with that. Um, we're going to have a little just... Like this, the next slide or something? Is that okay? Okay, all right. Um, excuse me, because I've got to get... I should have had this on before, but... It is a joy to see this church, to see uh, the fruit and the blossoming of my brother's work and others of you. I know there's a phenomenal leadership team here, and I've heard great things from Abner about the team, and um, now I'm getting to meet you in person, and I see Jesse's here, or is Jesse, yeah, Jesse, and I know Wes has been here, I heard Wes speak one time, and it was wonderful, and I'm sorry, I'm not, 
Carlos and his wife. And, no, I'm Car- <laughs> Carlos, and you're on the team, though, right? Amani and your, your wife, Jesse, doing working with the kids. Yeah. So anyway, I just I'm so grateful for this church and what God is doing here for Abner. Um, excuse me. I'm just trying. There we go. All right, we'll be set in a minute here. <laughs> okay, I think we're there. All right. So Abner came to me and said, I'm going to do a series on Shalom. Oh, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. Yes, yes. I'm excited about it. And, uh, and he said, would you be willing to come and, and take one of our weeks and share with the church? I said, oh, that'd be awesome. It'd be great. And, you know, I'm thinking about all the joyful, amazing things about Shalom. You know, like the, 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 the oneness and, and the delight and the garden and the beauty and all these, you know, there's nothing better than that. And then he tells me, I want you to, to take Genesis 3. So I have to talk about sin <laughs> and, and all the yucky stuff. But so anyway, I'm glad to do that because it's going to allow me to also address something that I feel like the Lord is calling the church globally to respond to now, and that is trauma. And we rarely talk about it in church. We're afraid to talk about it often. Sometimes it's taboo. And recently I've learned, I think it may be one of, if not the most critical emotional issue or critical issue in our world today and how we respond to this. Am I doing that by just, is there a way to, would that help? No. So, um, we'll just... <laughs> So we, this is a good example of a very minor trauma. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say up front, um, as we talk about this a little, it'll be more on a general scale, but it might be a little bit of a trigger for some of you, and I just want to say that up front and feel safe to um, do what you need to do with that. Um, but anyway, um, it is a pleasure to be here. And I want to start out uh, with a phrase my dad used to use when he would read stories to me before I go to sleep, or he'd tell us stories. And he would say, instead of once upon a time, he'd say, time upon a once, just to kind of get us. And we've heard in the beginning so many times, right? So why don't we start today with time upon a once. God created the heavens and the earth. And God finished his work and said, this is very good. It was really good. And then thousands and thousands of years later, on January 21st, 2023, someone came into the Star Ballroom Dance Studio in Monterey Park, killed 11 people, and injured nine others. How can something like this happen? How can something like this happen in a world created so very, very good? These types of questions were the things asked by the Israelites who were in exile in Babylon. How do we make sense of a good God who made a good world, and yet in the world around us we see such violence, hate, oppression, poverty, racism, How did we end up in exile? Why aren't the things, why aren't things the way they're supposed to be? And I think we get some answers to that in Genesis 3. And what I want to talk about in that chapter is this idea of the vandalism of Shalom. It wasn't just a few rules broken, it's just vandalism. This is just intense, destroying, destructive things. And then from that, the trauma of sin. 
Before we jump into that, let's take a look, a little bit of connect back to chapters one and two. The first three chapters of Genesis were actually compiled and canonized or, or became scripture for Israel during or slightly after Israel's exile in Babylon. So they had just been through a major social historical trauma, and they're putting together their scriptures. They're, they were things that had been compiled over time, stories that were written. Of course, they're attributed to Moses, and he may have written all the first five books of the Bible. Um, he may have written part of it, and other authors adding some later. We're not really sure about that. What we do know for sure is that whoever wrote Genesis 1, 2, and 3 were not there when it happened. So this came a lot later, and it's done very poetically to try to answer these kind of questions that people have about life. Why is there so much evil? Why does all this happen? Regardless of who wrote these things, we know they were inspired by God to help us understand some of these most complexing questions about a world that was created so good, and yet we see so much evil. What is this state of existence, though, that God calls very, very good? You guys know, because you've been talking about it. The best way to think of that very, very good world is the idea of shalom. Shalom is very, very, very complex. Okay, it, 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 you can't put it into one definition. It's the totality of all that God desires for everything. And I know you've been examining the first two chapters of Genesis and a world that was created by Shalom and for Shalom. And there's no better way to understand these chapters from a Hebraic perspective or what I think from God's perspective either. You're right on the right track. It can't be defined, as I said, but I do have this definition here from Cornelius Plantiga that I think is one of the most helpful. And we're there. Thank you. You're not giving me the clues and you're following me anyway. Um, but he says that shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation. Now, let's just stop right there. That webbing together, I think, is the whole framework and structure for shalom. That things are webbed together. That, that all of the universe is, is a whole. Where the whole together, the sum of all the parts, it's greater. The whole is greater than the sum of all these parts. There's a harmony. There's a joining together of everything within the universe. Just as God is one, three in one. But then we can add to that, webbing together in justice, delight. And we could add all kinds of words to that. That's where there's no end to the definition. We're webbed together in everything God wants for us. It's a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as the creator and savior open doors and welcome the creatures in whom he delights. And here's the best way to put it. Shalom, in other words, is the way things are supposed to be. So what, what I want to focus on today in Genesis 1 and 2 is this idea of, excuse me, human relational existence, which I think is the fabric and essence of life in this world. So a simple way to show it is this little circle here. Human relational existence is the totality or the multiplicity of all the relationships we have working together at the same time, that webbing together, okay? It's all of the relationships that we live and have our being in. We exist in relationship, don't we? Human beings are very relational. Are created that way. We can't even live without it. We can't exist without relationship with creation because we have to eat and breathe, and have water. We really can't exist outside of relationship with God. We, Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. Hmm? 
<laughs> yeah, this is. Why not? Maybe we should. Yeah. Or is that better? Uh, every time that... I'm not going to go like this. Hold on. Okay, how's that? Okay, and you hearing me? Okay, so please forgive the trauma of the uh, mic there for a while. Uh, but anyway, uh, these things are all interdependent and all functioning at the same time. And when the health or shalom of one is broken, it affects the other. Right? When our relationship with God is not doing so well, how are we with our spouse? No. Okay. We're not doing too well with ourselves. How does that affect our relationship with God? So in so this relational existence is this beautiful um, web of life that God has put together and is intended to function in shalom. We can see this in the first two chapters of Genesis, can't we? God made man, humanity, in his image. And he made them male and female. And that was to reflect God's image as being very relational. God is relational. And it was also meant to be almost a representation of God's authority and God's person on earth. In, in the time that this was written, a lot of kings would take and put a statue within a land that they had conquered to represent their authority there. That was their image. And that same Hebrew word was used for that. So man was put as God's image, God's mark of authority on the earth and in creation. So there's a relationship with God there in Genesis 1. There's a relationship between male and female, obviously. With the self, with ourself, I think it's interesting because you can see when Adam was asked to name a woman, he says, you are a bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And right there, Adam is gaining his own self-identity in relationship to the woman. Our identity is often formed in the relationships that we have with others, where we belong and who we're with. Male and female, relationship with others. They were to be fruitful and multiply. That takes relationship. They were to work together in the garden, walk with God together in the garden. And then they had relationship with creation. They were to cultivate the ground. The Hebrew word used here is shomar, which means to guard and to cultivate. So it's kind of a two-way um, job there that they had. They were going to cultivate this garden. They were going to keep it growing. They were going to keep this world of shalom growing and, and expanding. And then they were to guard it. And you've probably mentioned this, but this garden is the first tabernacle temple image in Scripture. This is where God came to dwell with humanity. Again, that relationship. This is where heaven and earth meet. Or where there is shalom on earth as it is in heaven. And they were to guard that. And they were to be the kings and priests of this place. And so this is, God established a social order there. And I call this the social health triangle. By social health, I don't mean so much what we might think of today, like just social work out in the world. It's totality of all our relationships being in health or being in shalom. What God intended for this human relational existence. And any um, social health triangle or a social order is going to have a base, something that it's based on, a perspective of how these relationships should be governed. And then there's a governing and regulating arm of that social order, which the Bible calls kingship or king. And then there's a mediating and facilitating arm of that social order that was called the priesthood. And then there's an apex, the top, the top authority. And in a healthy situation, it's God 
who's bringing about shalom covenantalism. God works in these relationships through covenant, and the purpose of that is for shalom among the world. And so God will use priesthood and God will use kingship to help bring that about. Now, in our world, um, those jobs of mediating and facilitating and governing take on all kinds of different forms, don't they? We've got media, we've got education, we've got church, we've got all, all kinds of things. And whether they're functioning or right or not is another discussion. <laughs> but their purpose in God is to make that healthy. And social order should come from the inside out. It should come from humanity in relationship with God, self, and others. And out of that grows healthy government, healthy priesthood, or healthy church, or healthy education, whatever you might want to say. And it's built on God's purpose of bringing about shalom. We turn to the tough questions we introduced at the beginning. Why aren't things the way they are supposed to be? So let's read our chapter for this week. You can kind of read along with me. Did I go? Yeah, this is right. Excuse me, just a minute. I want to start on, there we go. Okay, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild ad animal which Adonai God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you are not to eat from the, any tree in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you are neither to eat from it nor touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, it is not, is it not true that you, you will surely die? Is, really? Really? And, you know, serpent's kind of saying, really? Is that true? We ever get that little voice in our head? Because God knows that on that day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God and knowing good and evil. And it challenge the character of God, huh? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig trees together to make themselves loincloths. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you are not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden. I just did that one, didn't I? I'm sorry. Maybe I had to. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. They heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. There's our tabernacle again, right? God called to the man. Adam! Adam! Where are you? He answered, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I ordered you not to eat? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Notice the blame game. God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman answered, the serpent tricked me, so I ate. Adonai, God, said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. I will put animosity between you and the woman, between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. 
To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. You will bring forth children in pain. Your desire will be toward your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to what your wife said and ate from the tree about which I gave you the order, you are not to eat from it. The ground is cursed on your account. You will work hard to eat from it as long as you live. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat field plants. You will eat bread by the sweat of your forehead till you return to the ground, for you were taken out of it. You are dust, and you will return to dust. See, I told you this passage he gave me was going to be so happy and full of joy and everything like that. The man called his wife Hava, life, because she was the mother of all living. Adonai, God, made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Adonai, God, said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now to prevent his putting out his hand and taking also from the tree of life and eating and living forever, Adonai, God, sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the Kavurim, Kavurim, I believe, which is the Hebrew for angel, and a flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. What I want to explore in Genesis 3 is the vandalism of Shalom and the trauma of sin. And this is what happens to human relational existence from sin. Plantiga, that we referred to earlier, actually calls sin the vandalism of shalom, or that's a great way to think about sin. I think that's an excellent metaphor because it helps us to look deeper at sin as not just uh, a, a bad thing we did and now we're guilty with God, but something that really damages God's creation. Long-term permanent damage. It's something that results in trauma. We've been learning a lot about that in the last few decades, a lot of research. Trauma is not sin, and sin is not trauma. Got to be very careful not to put them as the same thing. Okay? If, if a person has trauma, that, that does not mean that is sin. Most often, it's because they've been sinned against. And haven't we in the church focused on our sins that we've committed, and rightly so, but very, very uh, neglected, let's say, those who've been abused and sinned against. How often do we really respond to that? We've, we've, it's, right, it's rightly so, because that's been the Western approach to sin ever since um, that doctrine came from Augustine. Trauma is multifaceted, and it differs in severity. There's no one definition of trauma, especially clinically. Right now, there's all kinds of types of trauma and, and diagnosis for it and definitions of it. But for our case, I think it's best just to be thinking of trauma as wound. That's the very essence of the word. It's a wound. And when we work with people who've suffered with trauma, we're dealing with wounded people. And aren't we all in some way? We've experienced some wounding. I imagine, and I know I can't feel what you felt, but I imagine since that shooting in your city, there's, there's something that we've, you've all felt. How could this happen in my city? And maybe you know some of the people that were involved or, or were injured or killed or others who were affected that way. It affects us all. 
Samuel Youngs, he's a great Christian theologian, and he's beginning to engage theologically with the idea of trauma. It's just starting, by the way, and recently, theology and trauma coming together. We have yet to go to missiology and, and trauma, but we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> but he says that trauma is any, any injury, any injury to the spiritual, psychological, emotional, physical, or social aspects of life. Does that look like our circle there of human relational existence? Any injury that continues to fester, color life, and inhibit healthy function. So are trauma and sin related? Well, does sin injure this world? Does it destroy shalom? Does it injure human flourishing? Trauma is the injurious effect of sin that perpetuates brokenness in human lives and human history. So we know that sin occurred in Genesis 3, right? The vandalism of shalom. But did that, did that injure God's shalom creation in such a way that per, it perpetuated brokenness in human history? Did something start right there? That you saw hit your city just a couple of weeks ago? Let's see if we might detect some of the first ripples of trauma in this passage. 3-7. After eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve realized they were naked. I've been in contact with a wonderful woman uh, back east. Her name's Jacqueline Dyer. She's um, a professor, and she's done a lot with social work and counseling, and is also an ordained minister. And we were talking about this passage, and she says, that's the trauma. When they first realized the state they were in, that traumatized them. And they came out with what? Shame. It was all this shame. And that's one of the common traits of all types of trauma that we experience. And often unwarranted shame, right? Someone's abused as a child or domestic violence, and that the one, the victim of that often feels shame. Now, they caused their shame here, right, in this chapter, <laughs> Adam and Eve. But it goes both ways. 3.10, he was afraid, and I hid myself. Fear, guilt, and shame followed trauma. And notice here, it's not just the emotions of fear and guilt. What is, what is Adam doing? Adam is, and Eve are hiding from God. They don't feel that secure, safe relationship that they had with God where they could just walk in the cool of the day with him in the garden and enjoy the temple and feel safe and secure and intimate with God. It affected that relationship. Secure relationships are so important. For children, my wife and I have learned this in our process of working with foster kids and children from foster kids is when children have been neglected or um, gone through many things at very young ages, the actual part of our brain that's called the relational part, you have a, a, a survival part of your brain. And then above that is where we learn and work with the relational side of life. What happens when young people are going through trauma is the bottom, the lower side of our brain, the, the survival fight just kicks in big time. And this relational side of our brain doesn't develop really well. And what comes from that is what we call attachment disorder. It's very hard to attach and to develop relationship. Now, it's possible to change that. The brain can even rewire Trauma affects our whole body, right? The body keeps the score. It affects our body, it affects our emotions, it affects our spirituality, everything. And yet, it can be changed and transferred. We're watching it right in front of our eyes with our two boys. It's not an easy task. It's not something that somebody comes up to the altar and you pray over them and they accept Jesus and it's gone. But... When you begin to renew those relationships, 
healthy, safe, good relationships with God, others, self, and things. It gets transformed, and our brains can actually rewire and change. Adam and Eve had attachment disorder here. Affected their relationship with God and with each other. 315, God is talking to the serpent. Now, notice the way it was reversed. God addresses Adam. <laughs> he says, oh, it was the woman. This is the one, oh, it was the serpent. And then God comes back, and then he goes, serpent, woman, Adam. <laughs> That's the way it ends, right? But here we see the beginning of animosity. God says there's going to be animosity between your descendant and the serpent's descendant and, and Eve's descendant. Now that sets up this whole idea of the animosity between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness. That's been throughout history, and here it begins. But it's interesting here because it says generations, and I think we can almost take from this a, a poetic, symbolic of idea of animosity throughout creation. And that has come into peoples with peoples. And then pain, 316, you will bring forth children in pain. Trauma always involves pain. Do we live in a pain-free world? No. What does it say at the end of the book, though, in Revelation? There will be no more pain and crying. Now, there will be some until then. But even the very call of God, the very thing that God had created mankind to do, to be fruitful and multiply, was now going to be with pain, childbearing. To have children would be painful. And I don't understand what that pain is like. <laughs> but I do know that there's pain even after the birth of your children. There's pain when your child is hurting. There's pain right now for mothers and fathers in Ukraine who have watched their children killed. There's pain for children who've lost their parents. There's pain when a parent loses their child at an early, early age. Sin causes trauma, and it perpetuates itself in human history. And then we see that there will be conflict between male and female in the beginning of domination. And that spreads beyond the male and female relationship, doesn't it? In Genesis 3.17, now God talks to Adam, and he says, the ground is cursed. You will work hard to eat from it. As long as you live, it will produce thorns and thistles. So work's not going to be fun now. Work's going to be hard. Going to work all your life for most people in the world, working so hard to never get ahead. Some people to wonder if I'm ever going to be able to feed my family. And yes, the ground does produce thorns and thistles and weeds, and those of us that work on our yard will see that every week, right? Every day. But thorns and thistles are also metaphors in Scripture. Jesus used thorns when he's talking about the word that was falling on different ground and that thorns would rise up and choke it. Was he talking about literal thorns? No. So as we're looking at work here and the idea of how the resources of the earth would feed and take care of humanity, this, these can be thorns and thistles of economics that are making it hard for some people to be flourishing and enjoy the good of the world. Oppression, human greed, causing poverty, the inability to provide for your family, and the wasteful use of the Earth's resources. A little bit of that's all foreshadowed here. In 319, he says to Adam, you are dust, and to dust you are returned. Now, I know 
some Christian traditions that would take that like this, that God is saying, you are dust. To dust you'll return. But maybe it's more like this. Adam, you broke relationship with me, and now without relationship with me, all you're going to be is dust. What you wanted to do with your life is just going to go back to nothing and dust. You have lost your meaning and purpose in life. You lost, forgot why you were here. This is broke. This was broken. And then God sent them out of the garden. Another major trauma in our world. It's called displacement. One of the worst there is. We see that in all the refugees, migrants, immigrants of our day, children in foster care, they've been taken from their home, displaced. And it's not just this place I knew where I was living and uncomfortable. You've been taken from home. You've been taken from the safety of where I belong. And now their kids in foster care are taken because it is not safe. And I like to make an argument here that God had them leave the garden because of safety, not because of his being so angry at them. I mean, he didn't, God's angry that sin has come into the world. But his move of Adam out of the garden was for their safety. If they had eaten from the tree of life and lived forever in a broken state of sin, that wouldn't be good for them, right? He needed a way to redeem it so that we could have redeemed bodies that could live forever. So he's, he's thinking of their good. Just like when young children are removed from homes to be in foster care. And there needs to be a repairing of place. And I remember one day when Michelle and I were sitting on our swing out in our backyard and we had Ricardo and he wasn't even adopted yet. Had it been about two years yet, Michelle? But he, he, was, he came to us at two. So maybe he, he, I don't know if he'd been there a year, but he's sitting out on the swing and he takes his hand and he touches my heart. He comes over like this and he goes, and then touches his. And then back, doubt my papa. And he touches Michelle, doubt my mama. And then he looks at our yard and he says, doubt my yard. <laughs> or his bike and everything. <laughs> he was beginning to feel placed again beginning to feel home. That's still a challenge for him because the trauma is still in his brain. The trauma from the past is still there. And we all the time are working to bring safe place and to, and to heal that displacement, just like God is doing with all of us. <laughs> We're home with him. And he wants us to say, that my papa. And look at our world around us to have my home. That's covenant, folks. And that's when Ricardo made covenant with us. So why was all this a problem? All these beginnings of social historical trauma? Because it destroyed God's social order. The greatest sin, or I think the sin, that took place in Genesis 3 is that Adam and Eve wanted to become like God. If you eat this, you'll be like God. They wanted to reverse the right roles. They wanted to become creator instead of creature. Good social order works when we know there's a creator and we are the creatures, <laughs> right? We, and we function under that authority. And Adam decided he was going to put on the crown and they were going to take the place of God. And that beautiful social health triangle now is closing in. And instead of social flourishing coming from the inside out, it's now being crushed and smothered and perpetuating that trauma 
until it becomes the religion of empire, until church and state work together for the power of the state. It's what the Bible calls Babylon. And if you watch the progression of Genesis 3, 4, all the way through 11, you see trauma perpetuating itself more and more until you get to Babylon in chapter 11, and then God has to call Abraham to begin again in establishing his social order of shalom on earth. This, this is a colonialism. This is Rome. This is Egypt. Maybe the U.S. is heading down this road in some ways. Socio-historical trauma is the injurious effect of sin that perpetuates brokenness in human lives and history. There was a glimmer of hope, though, in Genesis 3. Notice here that the man called Eve the mother of all living. So there was a little bit, a, a glimmer at the restoration of their purpose and meaning in life, right? The mother of all living. And then he made garments of skin for Adam and his wife. God was so loving, he was going to do something about the shame. He's going to do something about this trauma of sin that's affected all of humanity. How do we respond? to such a daunting power and dynamic, the trauma of sin. Well, he calls us back into the same ministry, the same priesthood of Adam and Eve, to be mediators and facilitators of a new social order. There's some good news, folks. God started a new social order. First and foremost, we respond to all this with the gospel. God so loved the world that he sent his son to come into the place. You can go to the next one. Yeah. He sent his son to come into the place of humanity, to become human and restore human relational existence, to restore our relationship with God, with others, with creation, with itself, to begin this new social order. That's what we call the kingdom of God that comes from the inside out and affects things. And so because of Jesus and because of this, and let me, yeah, let me just back up a minute too. Um, Peter in Acts 10 actually states the gospel this way. You heard the message. He's preaching at Cornelius' house, and he's talking to the Gentiles. And he says, you heard what was preached to Israelites, that there is now shalom. He uses the word, Greek word, adrene, but it's just, it's the same meaning as the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom through Jesus the Messiah. That's what he's saying there. Shalom through Jesus Messiah. Paul calls it the gospel of shalom. This is our gospel too. And instead of this, we can go next. We now have this. Next one. Jesus takes us into himself, humanity in Christ. Notice that the human beings are in Jesus now. This is what Paul means to be in Christ. And he restores the right social order with God, with ourself, with creation, with others. And we now function as extensions of his arms, these two arms that are part of the Triangle. This is the base. These are the arms. That's the apex. We're now part of his government, part of his kingdom. We're now his priesthood. And we are to assume our role again as cultivators of the Shalom Garden, as ambassadors of this new social order in Christ, as facilitators of God's healing and transformational love and power with the trauma of sin. 
We're a kings and priests, and we function as a sign, a foretaste, and an instrument of this new social order. Time upon a once, God created the heavens and the earth. And then one day, thousands and thousands of years later, someone came into the Star Ballroom Dance Studio in Monterey Park and killed 11 people and injured nine others. But that's not the end of the story. There was a community of Jesus disciples planted in Monterey Park, California, a community called River of Life Church, and they were a communi community dedicated to cultivating and mediating shalom among themselves and among those hurting and traumatized in their city. They became a sign, a foretaste, and an instrument of hope and redemption in the city. And countless numbers of people came to know God and his shalom in the city of Monterey Park. realizing that I'm probably, I should probably stand over there with him. Or actually, can, can you come over here with me real, really quickly? Yeah. Just, yeah, just come over, just for the sake of the camera. Uh, the, the, our online people can hear me, but they can't see, uh, can't see me. Yeah. So, um, I don't know about you guys, but I felt the weight of the break in Shalom as, as Andy was writing out each one of the, my bad. As, as Andy was showing us those slides of where the vandalism of Shalom was happening, I think with everything that he mentioned, I, I think my heart just, just sank, you know? Um, because we've been talking about God's purposes, and then we see today at how many levels, you know, I mean, at, at all levels, actually. Uh, Shalom is broken. So I, th I thought the, the first thing that we can do is just maybe um, maybe in silence, uh, be able to mourn that and just, just hold, hold on to that, right? Uh, and, and as Andy shared, the, the story actually doesn't end there, right? Like that, that the Lord continued his plan of um, Shalom. But I think we, it's appropriate I think to sit in the in the trauma of what happened. Mm -hmm. So, can we do that? Can I mention one thing that yeah. goes with that? Um, sorry. There we go. Some of the reading I've been doing with trauma and theology has presented this idea idea of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with the Passion of Jesus, and encouraging us when we're addressing trauma to stay in Saturday a little bit. Friday being the trying, we, we do know Sunday, we do proclaim Sunday, we do know it's coming. But sometimes we need to sit in Saturday a little while to really, really be able to embrace Sunday. Yeah. Um, you guys need to know that as a congregation, we're going to be reading the book of Amos. I think it's starting in, in March. And, and that book, I'll be really honest with you, it's going to be three months of staying in Saturday. And I know because I've done the outline for it, for us already. And the only hopeful remarks in that book are at the very end. Um, so we thought that it would be appropriate to remind us of the vision of Shalom and to have us dwell on that for two months before we hung out on Saturday <laughs> for three months. Uh, so we, we're going to spend a lot of time there, but I'm going to give you guys maybe uh, two minutes just to just to respond to the Lord in, in prayer. Lord, what what was speaking to you? Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to give Andy the, the stage again and give you all an opportunity just to ask questions. Uh, have a, Q, a short Q&A time before we do communion together. Is that OK, um, Lord, we just ask that you would. Yeah, just help us stay in in, in Saturday like. Andy was saying, Lord, uh, we, we do look <laughs> forward to Sunday, but right now I just feel like we need to, to I think, think about uh, just the consequences, Lord, of what went on. 
in Genesis 3 because we've, we've all felt it, Lord, in our families, in our nation's history, in our families' histories, Lord, that all of us have been impacted um, by the things that Andy was talking about today. So, Lord, we just we give you the space to speak to us. Lord, we thank you that the story doesn't end there. Uh, we thank you that you are one who makes shalom, that you are the prince of shalom, that you are committed to shalom. Lord, we thank you for uh, your calling on us as individuals and as a church uh, to be peacemakers, Lord. Blessed are those who make peace, for they would be called children of God. And I thank you for that, Lord. Uh, Father, I thank you for Andy. I thank you for just the work that he did in scripture and Lord for the ways that he's just uh, led us today and opening our eyes to, to the implications of the fall, Lord. Uh, I thank you for the ways that he, he talks about the fall and ways that goes just beyond personal sin, <laughs> Lord, but that talks about, um, yeah, the vandalism of Shalom at every level, Lord. And I pray that as a church, we would be mindful to preach a gospel that takes all those things into account, Lord. So we thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Um, Andy, I'm going to have you take this microphone and I'm going to give people an opportunity to ask questions with the microphone that you're holding in your hand. Is that okay? You want me to? Yeah. Here, give me that one. Oh. And you hang out over here. Okay. And I'll walk around. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I asked Andy if you... Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake of my online peeps, uh, I asked Andy if he'd be willing to, uh, you know, we're committed to being a hybrid church, so we always got to be mindful right. of the sound. Right. Um, yeah, I asked, I asked Andy if he'd be willing for a few minutes just to take some of our questions, and it could be questions that you have about the issue of shalom, it could be questions that you have about the issue of trauma. Uh, Carlos, if you could do me a quick favor and maybe sit in front of the computer on Zoom and if you could have our online people, if you guys could maybe just type in your uh, questions in the chat box so that Carlos can raise his hand and maybe ask them. But uh, for those of you who feel comfortable and are motivated, uh, it's not every day that we have fuller professors hanging out with us. So <laughs> he hates that. But um, yeah, anybody have uh, questions that you would like to ask Andy about the passage or about other things that are happening on the text? So we know why the problem exists. Is there a fix? I mean, like you said, Jesus came and forgave us. But it seems like, I mean, it's still things. A guy walked into a dance studio last week and showed us how Shalom is still broken. Yeah. What can, what else can we do? Is there, can we? As a church? Sure, yeah, as a church, yeah. sure. Yes. Um, well, let me preface that by you. you
brought up a great point because this is why we need to talk about trauma in the church because we don't know what to do. Um, it's a very new field in terms of study. It's been here all through human history. But it's for, and, it's, and if you learned, uh, if you understand it, you learn to read the Bible. The bi entire bi Bible is a redemptive trauma narrative. It runs through the whole thing. Uh, and as shalom becomes the goal and the promise, it's always encounter to trauma. Um, at this point, uh, the things I would, would suggest or say to you as a church is that, um, one, that clinical counseling can be very important and a very needed aspect, but it in itself cannot transform trauma. I think of it better in terms of transforming trauma than just healing. Healing, is yes, that's part of that. But our view in the West of healing is very limited. It's my symptoms went away. And that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a whole transformation into a new creation. And with trauma, it's got to be that. And the memories oftentimes are never going to go away because God's not going to erase our memories of our mind. Right? But the pain of that can be transformed. And the idea that I went, we experienced this trauma can then be turned into something that I can use to bring help and redemption to others. So a person can, can go through a complete transformation and become a new creation and become a shalom help giver or producer in the world with trauma. Um, I think even in the new creation, I don't know that we'll ever totally forget that these kinds of things happened. Just like Jesus still has his what? His scars. Jesus still has his scars. But he's not feeling the pain of the nails in those scars right now or the weight of the sin of humanity and all that he took on himself. And remember, he, he took on the pain. He took on our sorrows and our pain. He bore it in his body for us. And we need to keep embracing that. Um, so there's, there's a, a lot of trauma that cannot be healed or transformed through clinical psychological help. Now, that's a part of it. And we need to be able to discern when we should recommend counseling. But the thing that people need most is safe, whole community. And that's what we are as a church. And a, and a place that can... Offer good news without pushing it. Offer good news as they're ready. Help them live in Saturday as they need to. Um, I would love to see programs where you kind of like an alpha thing, but you call it something like a, a beginning to healing. And, and you just help people begin to see what the process is, that one, you need to be able to even articulate that it happened. That could, that's a big step. That's hard to even know. Sometimes we can't even remember and articulate what actually happened from the trauma. So there's a need to be able to say it and then begin to recognize how it impacted you and then ability to embrace hope and then to become a part of the bigger redemptive story. And that's a process, but we could have something to introduce people and then create um, close-knit, safe community groups within the church that can help people process this, even as they're reading scripture and seeing it in there. And that. So I think there's a lot that church can do. One of, the, one of the, probably the biggest things is creating those safe relationships and understanding, because we're so used, aren't we? We're so used to quick fix. And maybe transfer from the idea of winning souls to healing souls. And let it be, let God lead us in that process of that. And not feel competitive like we need to get a thousand people in our building in three years. But let's really bring redemption, health, and healing. Anyway, thank you for the question. Anybody else have questions? Wes? Thank you for speaking to us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. My question is, um, as I'm hearing you, the uh, trauma, I'm imagining this. I'm not sure you expressly said this, so I'm just hoping you might be able to speak to this other component of it. I'm hearing the um, effects of sin as the person who was sinned against and the trauma that uh, comes from that. Uh, 
is there a trauma that arises from the commission of sin? Yes. Yes. How does that function? Um, It hardens us often to being less human. Um, Obviously, there's guilt and shame tied with that as well. So if trauma is an injury and it inhibits healthy function, the committing of sin as well as the sin being committed to you can traumatize our healthy existence. As we know. And then there are studies now on perpetrator trauma too, even as nations. There's some interesting stuff about Germany, what they've gone through as an entire people group post um, Holocaust and the trauma that they've experienced as a society. Um, yeah, and it's different effects. And we need to be careful not to say, oh, you know, perpetrators, you're just insane. But no, the, the victim, we need to be almost victim, pro-victim in a sense. But but the, our gospel needs to speak to both perpetrator and victim. And it does. It does. Um, what's really sad, I, I find awful, is that victims of trauma can often become perpetrators, right? Because of that damage there. I mean, I can... I can sit there and get very angry about what birth parents did to my children, but I realize that their parents did it too. And I'm down the road. And I even have a gut feeling that that chain of effect, maybe even going back to colonialism and what was done to their country through that. So it's a vicious, vicious circle, isn't it? Thank you, Wes. Okay, so I, honestly, I feel like sort of like confused right now because, and this is just my own personal journey, right? I mm-hmm. was raised Catholic, and then in my 50s, I became born again Christian, and I was saved by, oh, you're going to go to hell, you know, the fear of hell kind of thing, right? And then I, and then I started hearing, no, what about uh, having that right now on earth, right? That we can have that kingdom right here on earth. So it's like, okay, so if I'm trying to share the gospel with somebody else, how do I do that? Because it was like, first I was like trying to do that sinner's prayer thing and make people feel intimidated. You're going to go to hell. And then now it's like, okay, we're not supposed to do that. Now you're talking about trauma and healing hearts. So I'm like, where do, where am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do? Do I just try to maintain my relationship with God and the trauma I caused myself through my repetitive sin? Or do I am trying to do that and try to work with other people? I I'm just don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, <this one. laughs> no, I think I think you brought up some some very good points there in that as as it starts with us addressing our own trauma in our life with God and with brothers and sisters or whom we're safe, and then beginning to see how does the gospel how how has the gospel come in and been transforming for me and brought that kingdom now and the heaven on earth. And, you know, I, I, I've seen God, I was in a car accident that just was severe trauma and it affected my neck deeply. And I've had pain for years and years since. And I had four discs removed and replaced in here about 30 years later. And as I've learned, I've realized this has affected my energy. It's affected my ability to relate sometimes. It's affected my thinking about myself, you know, because it affects all of us. And so as I, I process that with the gospel, I've come to a greater encounter of shalom in many areas of my life that I didn't know before. So I have that to share with others. Um, and I think with trauma, how it affects everybody differently and everybody's experience, we, we need to listen first, just be there with people and listen to them and create a safe relationship. And as they maybe begin to share some of these things from their life, begin to say, yeah, I, I know I went through this and Jesus did this for me. And, you know, just let the whole, this sounds like a cop out, but let the Holy Spirit lead you because the Holy Spirit is very, very interested in loving people and guiding you and trust your own journey because God's going to use your own journey in your testimony. Another helpful thing would be to have the testimonies of people who've gone through trauma, expose it. 
witness to it, and then witness to the grace and the love of God but being present in that and how God has transformed. Um, sometimes I think we feel a little bit of a rush in our communicating of the gospel. Does that make sense? And so if we, if we come along, look at Jesus with the woman at the well. He came and he sat down, and then he empowered her. And her speak, would you, can you give me a drink? And then he began to get her to talk about her life. Well, I, you've been with, you know, five men. And, the, and he never blamed her for that, by the way. Did you notice that? He never says, you sinned. Who knows what those men were doing and why she was in that situation. But he has her get to that place of pain in her life. And then he says, I have a drink of living water for you if you'd like it. He's very gentle about it with her. Her life is transformed, and then she goes and ministers to a whole community who now discover the Messiah. Hope that helps a little. <laughs> and Andy and Michelle are going to be around as we as we eat uh, in in the next ten minutes. So, if, if you guys have more questions uh, for them, uh, as a couple, you you guys are more than welcome to hang out and sit with them and, and eat with them. Um, Carlos, you, you could also switch in OBS over to the congregation camera on top of that speaker. Um, I think for the sake of time, though, I'm going to just lead us in communion. I know it's like a weird transition. I don't know how else to do it. But um, I, I thought uh, as, we're, as we're engaging in communion this morning, I'm, I'm going to read a passage, obviously. I'm going to have you guys come up. Um, Michelle and Andy, would you guys be willing to help me? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we, we have uh, bread and our, our juice here. Uh, if, if, if you feel comfortable when you come up, you could do one of two things. You could grab the bread and then dip it in the, in the juice. Or if you would prefer to take one of the little packages like we've had, you could do either one. So, um, Michelle and Andy, if you could, if you guys could, could maybe stand in, in the front with me up here in, in front of the table. Um, Michelle, I'm going to hand these to you. And then I'm going to have you hold that one too. And then Andy, I'll, I'll have you hold the little packages on the other side. Uh, so let, let us remember what the Lord has done for us. That on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when you're ready, just please come up. And like I said, whatever you feel comfortable with with um, when, when we're all done uh, getting hold on to it by the way and I will I will pray for us at the very end let's take communion together but you guys could come up when you're ready
Lord, uh, we love you, Lord God. We thank you so much for, like, like we've been talking about, Lord, your vision of shalom. God, I pray that as we're taking communion today, Lord, that you would remind us to, to hand you the crown and have you be at the center. Lord, to take ourselves uh, out of the center, Lord, and, and to be the type of community that is, is going to partner with you and join you in, 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 in making all things new in Monterey Park and in our surrounding communities. So, Father, we, we thank you for your continued vision of Shalom. God, we thank you for the series. We thank you for the book of Genesis. Lord, we thank you for uh, the people who put it together, Lord, over the centuries. And, uh, Father, I, I'm so grateful that it still, still speaks to us. Lord, as, as we're um, thinking about the fall this week, uh, God, would we also remember uh, that, that, that you're not done, that you did not give up on creation, Lord. God, that you're still committed to your vision and that you, as a loving God, have, since the beginning of time, um, really gone out of your way to, to restore what was broken in the garden. And we thank you for that, Lord. So let's go ahead and, and take communion together. You could thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, thank you so much, Andy. That was very rich, and um, I, as I was, I really resonated with what Abner said. That when you were speaking, I felt the weight. I felt, but there's the Holy Spirit in that. Like I just felt like there was the weight of. Oh, I felt the grief of God over those things too. You know, just the ache of like, oh, all that was broken and thinking about like all like Ukraine, refugees, immigrants, I mean, just foster care, all the layers upon layers, not to mention how that's all touched our life personally. You know, I know, it's like, oh, so I'm glad. Thank you for giving us a moment just to sit in that. I just encourage us. Um, I'm learning how mourning is okay. Sadness is okay. Learning to not be afraid of it. Most of our life we avoid it but actually learning how to sit in that. So I just encourage you over the course of the week, go back to some of these notes. And even this afternoon, I feel the need to do that and let yourself weep. It's like, oh, you know, just, just to be able to, yeah, express that and to be with God in that. And it's like, oh, and what a powerful image that Jesus is one that comes right in the midst of the trauma. And that's where he dies for us, right in the midst of it all. And it's like, oh, it's one of the most beautiful parts about our faith is that Jesus comes near, right in the midst of the deepest darkness. Um, and that touches my heart. Even doing communion in the midst of Genesis 3 is powerful. It's like, oh, Jesus, that you come in the midst of all that was broken. And you die and you take it upon yourself and you rise again and you're a part of bringing the shalom back into our world. And that is, that is good news. And so um, thank you for very rich. And I just, that image, I just want to leave us with that image too of like your son, Ricardo, being able to say like, and then touch you as like my papa, my mama, my yard. You know, there's something of restoration there. And that is an image that God is doing for all of us. Like you said, like, oh, my papa, you know, my home, my community, my good relationships. Like, oh, that is a good news. And that God is inviting us as a church to experience that. I love that. It's a powerful picture of life groups is a place of, of this kind of transformative healing community. Like, wow, so powerful through relationships, through the scripture. And then as a collective churches, we're learning how to partner with the other churches in Monterey Park. I thought about Carlos's question, like, well, what do we do? As one church, it's hard, but you start you know, partnering with other churches. I had this image when I was praying, as we start partnering with the larger church in Monterey Park, all of a sudden there's a web of resource that comes and it's, we don't have to be everything at River of Life because there's other churches that are other things. It's like, oh, hallelujah, and the impact that can happen. So anyways, I'm getting excited, but um, 
but I do think that, um, yeah, and a, and a beautiful image at the end that you gave us of not just winning souls, but or winning lives, but healing lives. And I think that might be something we keep holding on to as a church that might be connected to our vision as a church healing lives. And it's not necessarily about the large scale, everything, but the deep transformative work and then how that ripples out into the world. So lots of good things to kind of feast on in our souls and keep thinking about. And, um, and also as we meet and eat together. So not a lot of announcements other than the fact that we do have those life groups this week, we're going to be starting to move into prayer actually related to, we don't want to just learn about Shalom. We want to experience Shalom as we enter into the, maybe those places of trauma in our life, the places where broken Shalom has happened. And we bring those before God consistently. And we'll be doing that through Easter to be able to ask for God to, um, to continue to bring shalom in our lives today. So we'll be starting that off in life group in this next week. And um, we have Jen and David's baby shower. Another, I think it all touches back to shalom. Just that, you know, this baby that is being born and the gift and, you know, um, yeah, just the opportunity to be community around them. So that's on February 11th, next Saturday at Janelle and Sam's house. If you didn't get the Evite and you want to go, sometimes we miss an email address or something. Talk to me or Janelle and Sam. Janelle has been operating that Evite. So it's 11 o'clock next Saturday, an opportunity to be a community around them. And then giving is our, our regular way you can give in the back in the offering box. You can do it through Zelle. And the, our email address is riveroflifempk dot org and you could give through zell what oh i'm confused oh email it's our email address okay too many addresses no river of life mpk at gmail.com okay so that's how you give through zell talk to me later if that's totally confusing you could also give through the website all right let me pray for us and bless our meal god thank you for a rich feast today um yeah what we see of your scripture is that it's not narrow it's not just an inch deep it's there's so much depth there's so much there and um god thank you that you're discipling us in this god thank you for um andy and just helping us take in the weight of sin on all levels and um and thank you jesus also for the hope that you have come into that trauma and our partnering now with the church to bring redemption in the world. So we thank you, God, for that good news. And we thank you for good food and eating together and how you nourish us with food and community and just pray your blessing over that as well. So thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Bless you, church. And let's grab our kiddos too.